Welcome back. I am joined here with Seth from IBM, and we're going to have a, an expert session where Seth is going to guide us through data mesh, data fabric, and some of the terms that a lot of you have been asking, you know, what does this really mean? You've heard the terms. Seth is going to clear up for us what they really mean. Please introduce yourself. Yeah, Seth, thanks. So I'm yourself. Seth Dobrin. I'm the global chief AI officer at IBM. And uh, sorry it's me instead of John Emeritt, but unfortunately he tested positive for COVID, so he's stuck back in his hotel room. Uh, happens. So, da data mesh is a term that's been flying around for a couple years, but uh, I've been saying here uh, that we hear the term here at the conference one or two years in advance, and then people start to have to do the thing that they hear. And so now it, it's not just a term anymore, right? People are, are putting this into practice. Yeah, so I think, um, I think data mesh is, has kind of matured into what we talk about as data fabric. Okay. And I think you were asking me before we came up, what's the difference between data mesh and data fabric? Uh, you know, I, I've been having some conversations with Gartner about this. And you know, I think um, I think my perspective, and I believe theirs, is that data mesh is static, uh, meaning that you have a single view. There's no active metadata. There's no active governance. There's no active policy enforcement, data residency enforcement. Data fabric enables you to connect to a vast majority of data sources across an organization's landscape, whether it's on public cloud or private cloud or multiple private clouds, or in a SaaS property and enable you to connect it and get value from it. Mm -hmm. is, uh, is data mesh a technical architecture or is it an organizational architecture or both perhaps? Well, so again, we, at IBM we think about, we talk about data fabric. Mm -hmm. we, we, don't, we don't have, our, our, our products are more active. So we have active metadata involved. We have active. Has it superseded uh, yes. the other? Okay. Yeah, so okay. it's superseded data fabric. It's more, or data mesh, it's more advanced than data okay. mesh. Um, and it's really what enables us to have this combination of both centralized mm. data and decentralized data. And in today's polyglot, multi-cloud, hybrid cloud world, you can't centralize everything. Bringing everything into one database, data structure, there, there's no value uh -huh. to it in most cases. Um, in most cases, you want to centralize data when it's required. So mm. for instance, I want one view of my customers, that should be centralized. I only want one answer when it comes to finance data that absolutely should be centralized and everything should pull for those. But if from a manufacturing organization, and you know, I have most manufacturing, large scale manufacturing organizations, as you know, have data centers at their various sites, mm. right? I don't need to centralize all that data across the various sites to build models on it or to understand what's going. I need to be able to collect, connect virtually to it and get those insights. Right. And then you can use either, you know, bring the data together when you need to to retrain models, mm. or probably more tenable is doing federated learning, training at each of the sites, bringing the changes and adjustments and the hyperparameters together and build it, creating a new model from those adjustments to the hyperparameters or the different features of, of the model. Uh, you know, you also see this across multiple clouds, so I may have data on AWS, on Azure, on IBM Cloud, at multiple private clouds on-prem, legacy data sources in Salesforce and Workday. Mm. How do I bring all this together in a way that's scalable for my employees and looks like it's a single, like it is in a single place even though it's not? Yeah. If we compare it with another technology, like um, uh, just conceptually, like version control uh, for code or something like that, uh, you have a tool like Git that enables it, that is uh, where the features drive certain behaviors in the developers. And then you have the software engineering methodology, which might uh, tell you that you need to do things a certain way. Which of those two directions do you feel is dr are driving these changes more? Is it technological? Uh, things that are pushing, or, or are they like governance and people things? So, so it's both business needs and technological advancements. Mm. Um, so business leaders and business users and data analysts that sit in the business need to have access to data. Yeah. And they need to be able to bring it together in a way that scales, mm. and in a way that's in a single pane of glass and is appropriately governed. Right. Um, and so all of the thought, when we, when we talk about data and AI, the purpose is to drive business value for business users and with the best ROI. Yeah. Centralizing data takes a long time, it's costly. Usually those projects fail because people get bored with them because they're not getting value from them, right? The, the people who are paying for it are in the business and they're yeah. not getting value, why are they going to pay for it? Um, and so I think it's important to talk about it from 
I'm going to skip through some of these because this is really an AI focus, but you know, I'm, I'm going to skip to this slide here, which just talks about data fabric, and this talks about things that business leaders need. Business leaders lead self-service access to data and models for their organizations. They need to augment their, their, their knowledge across the organization, and this helps them build, an, by, we do this by building an abstraction layer across all the data through technology called data virtualization. And it wasn't until about 18 months, 24 months ago that the real virtualization was even existing. Before that it was federation, federation that we everyone rebranded as, as virtualization. So the last couple of years you've seen that. You know, smart integration, so we have all these data across all the different entities. How do we bring them together in a conformed matter? Mm. How do you use AI to understand data, integrate data, bring it together, you know, multimodal data governance? So as we're moving data across, how do I ensure that that data movement can happen, happen in the first place, right? Because there's data residency, data sovereignty laws, there's data privacy we need to be worried about, especially you know, here in the European continent where GDPR is, is, is you know, well everywhere GDPR impacts, but especially here. How do we make sure that people are getting access to personal data only when appropriate? How do we make sure that data scientists are only using data for the intended purpose? That's really important. And then having a unified lifecycle management. So you have all these disparate data sources, you need to be able to enforce a lifecycle management across it. Um, and Companies can often get in trouble when you think about governance processes, especially if there's regulation. If they, they do it really well in one part of the organization and they don't do it well in another part, mm. a regulator can come in or you can get sued and they can say, well, you know how to do it. You're doing it really well over here. You chose not to do it over here, so thus you're liable. Right. Right, or more, I'm mean, not a lawyer, so, right, so more likely to be liable. And so, once you do it well, you have to be able to do it well across everything. Data Fabric enables you to do that. And then of course, like I said before, it's delivered across any, any form factor, you know, public cloud, private cloud, edge, yeah. uh, et cetera. So, okay. so that's, that, and, and this is a very active process. So Data Mesh is static. You build this, it doesn't do it automatically. Someone's got to really implement it. And so think about, you know, everyone knows IBM Watson, yeah. that's our brand for AI. Yeah. This is all driven by Watson AI technology. Okay. I'm actually impressed that we're getting closer to the hybrid cloud uh, approaches to stuff as fast as we are because... We're not getting close to it, we're doing it. There are real companies, real large scale companies doing it today. Right, and the, the, the reason why one was skeptical to begin with was that many of these softwares or services that were offered were, I think, purposefully designed to lock you in to that cloud platform, making it yeah. super difficult, you know, if you put it into some kind of big table, let's say, somewhere, uh, it would be very hard to get the data well, out of it. Com companies are still doing, trying to, you know, there are some startups that are still trying to do that today. Right, and, and so it's pretty neat that we're seeing the convergence there, but one question then is, um, th the terminology was different, but maybe some of the concepts had precursors in the early uh, big data platforms of the uh, 2008-ish era from, you know, Cloudera and these people, they, they were talking in similar concepts and maybe it was too early or maybe it wasn't exactly the same thing. What do you yeah, think? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I was, before I, I was only been at IBM for five years, so before I joined IBM, I was at one of the companies that were leading this, so we were Cloudera's first customer, we were mm. Neo's first customer, we were, you know, name, name one of these big companies been around for 10 years, we were their first customer, mm -hmm. um, enterprise customer. And so, if you look at, what, what Hadoop was driving and, and MapReduce, right, which is really what enabled, which is really what drove, MapReduce is what drove the, the adoption of Hadoop. That was driving dump everything into a central source. Mm. Um, Cloudera's intent was not for companies to do that, but that's what they did. Cloudera's intent was for them to put it in there in a way that maintained metadata, that maintained kind of intelligence yeah. about what's in there. Yeah. The reality is in most cases that's not what happened. And, and you know, Hadoop is very expensive, mm. right? And so you have triple copies, it's not, it's not inexpensive, and so that's why once Spark emerged, you start seeing what's closer to what we're talking about today with the data fabric, mm. where you put everything in an object store, and then you use Spark and Kafka, Confluent, right, to, to start moving data around, and that enables you to get what we called back then more of a data hub, yeah. where you kind of, you know, you still can have some centralized data, have some decentralized data, um, and you use these modern tools. And this was very immature then, you had to build it yourself. Today, 
you can get it out of the box from us yeah. and from a couple others. Um, and then you have companies like, like Dremio, who's over here, who really accelerate this concept of data lake house yeah, yeah. that enables you to truly operate both at a warehouse level and at this level simultaneously. I think one of the things that we seldom saw actualized back then was you know, Cloudera was talking in terms of uh, security, data lineage, and a lot of things besides just the computational part, but it always ended up being that if you installed Hadoop, you just used it as a big database, which yeah. was very, such a shame because there's a, so much more and, to be doing. And, and, and we, we moved from, you know, we bought a data warehouse, so everything's going to go into a data warehouse, mm. to we bought Hadoop, so everything's going to go into exactly. Hadoop. Exactly. <laughs> Hadoop does not solve every problem, right? Mm. Hadoop is a columnar data source, our store, and if you look at what it is, it's an object store that uses Parquet mm. to store the data in those columns, uh, and, and there are absolutely use cases where that's important for different types of, of querying. Geospatial data is also a really good fit for Hadoop, but if you're just putting data there, it, it's, it's overkill, mm. right? Um, and, and you know, again, back to an object store. Go back to what, you know, object store with Parquet, mm. with, you know, with Spark, and some kind of elastic search technology that, that should be the default. In fact, at my former company, we moved quickly from Hadoop into everything started in object store with uh, Spark and, and Elasticsearch, and you had to talk your way out of it. So mm -hmm. if you were going to centralize data, that's how you had to centralize it. And that's the concept, really, that Data Fabric is built on, is if you're going to centralize data, it should be in an object store. Mm -hmm. In fact, the back end of a lot of these Data Fabric technologies are, are object stores. Uh, but you can also connect everything more broadly across the organization. So in the offering that comes, uh, that comes from IBM, or the offerings, I guess that's maybe my question. Is it an offering, or do you see it as offerings, and how do you see the yeah. modular aspect in supporting get the... Get rid of uh, this? Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, oh, maybe there. Let's see. There we there go. We go, genius. I can outsmart the inanimate object, which <laughs> is what I always challenge my kids to do. Um, so when you think about what Data Fabric is from IBM, mm. so we have Cloud Pack for Data, okay. which is our product, our, our product portfolio that deliver, essentially delivers Data Fabric among other things. Um, and but people don't. Again, we have to stop talking about technologies when we're selling them. We have to start talking about outcomes, right. especially since business users, business lines of businesses typically have a big say in what you what what we get money for or what IT organizations get money for. Again, data privacy and governance that's a key factor in driving uh, uh, in driving data fabric. So mm -hmm. a lot of companies are still focused on this. Multi-cloud data integration combined with data governance and privacy getting a single view of customer, or product, or people, or whatever, getting that single view, and then delivering AI governance through ML ops and trustworthy AI. So these are the entry points, if you will, into okay. our product for, for Data Fabric, which is Cloud Pack for Data. Okay, so it's, it's about having a holistic strategy to these emerging best practices in data management. Would that be a correct Data management and AI. And AI. Yep, so, so think about it, the goal of this is to build data products mm. and to build AI products. Right. Right, so the goal of these two things in Data Fabric, the ultimate goal is we want to make data available to people in the company or we want to sell it uh -huh. and we want to make models available. Now to do that, you need to be able to implement concepts of observability from product development. So back to your analogy to product development, you need to have observability around your data, right. where you need to know typical data governance things like data quality, mm. data completeness, uh, you know, uh, are, are the pot privacy policies being enforced? Is there mm. personal data in it? So you need to apply that, but you also need to start thinking about what's required for that data, for the, the use of that data from an SLA perspective. Right. Is the payload being delivered in a timely manner to solve the problem that the business user is being, be, be, be trying to use it for? Mm -hmm. And so you need to start thinking about those concepts here. Okay. You need to start thinking about the same concepts here and moving away from just thinking about performance metrics and fairness metrics. Right. Those are important, absolutely, but you also need to start thinking about this model, this AI, is feeding something. Yeah. Right. It's going into a process. It's going into a workflow. Yeah. So you know, and I were talking about banks before, right? If I'm a bank and I'm scoring a fraud model, you're talking sub-second requirement. Uh -huh. Can that model score sub-second like you needed to? Uh -huh. Now, you in order to score that model sub-second, the data pipeline, mm. the features that are proprietary to that model, mm. need to be delivered sub-second as well right. in order to keep the model moving. And so. 
that data SLA is not just important for data products, mm. it's also important for AI-driven products. Mm, that makes sense uh, from an operations perspective. I think uh, it's, it seems that these products have come uh, into their own and are maturing in a way where you know, the, the skepticism that one might have had uh, a year or two ago in trying them uh, shouldn't necessarily be there. Nevertheless, you know, things always move slower than we as engineers might wish for them. What would you say are the top three sort of, uh, not top three stumbling blocks, but what, is, what are like the stumbling blocks that, that people come across and how can they avoid them? Yeah, so I think, I think the, the, biggest, the, the biggest impact, the biggest inhibitor to doing this right mm. is not having a strategy. Okay. And by a strategy, I mean what outcomes, what are the business problems I'm trying to solve. Mm. So if you were to try and do this across your whole organization at once, it's not going to happen overnight. Okay. And so you need to prioritize how that's going to get done. It needs to be tied to business value. And by business value, I mean money. Mm. How much money is it going to save me? How much money is it going to make me? Right? And so you need to do all of these things, do this, you know, build this data fabric with an outcome in mind, with a business user involved, so that, to my point earlier about often these projects fail because the business loses interest in it, yeah. is because they're not getting value. Right. Back to agile principles. How can I get value in like two or three sprints every time? So but is how it do I deliver value to, in six weeks? Is it possible to chop this up? I mean, does the entire organization have to have bought into it? Or is it possible to do no. it piecewise? No, 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 you should do it piecewise. You shouldn't do it holistically all at once. It's too oh. heavy of a lift. Okay. You need the organ not only not only do you need to implement the technology and get your data connected to this technology, mm. the people that are the technologists that are using it and building it and implementing it need to learn about it. Right. And they need to make mistakes that are you know pr pr relative to their organization. Every company has their own security requirements, their own security uh -huh. system. You know, every company has different business users, different, you know, different implementations of the same hardware, mm. use the clouds differently. And so there's always going to be, you know, this technology can get you 70, 80% of the way, the way there. That last 20% is always the hardest, right? And that's, that's usually somewhat customized to each organization, how you implement it, how you're using it. So having a business outcome or set of business outcomes that this is going to enable is really, really important. And, you know, the business outcomes can be one of these, but they can also be, I want to increase the NPS mm. of customers for this business. In that case, you're going to be focusing on these. On, on, you're going to be focusing on all of these yeah. because you need governance because it's customer data. It probably resides across multiple clouds. You need to understand your customer and you need to build models. Yeah. And so you're going to implement horizontally for a vertical use case. What would you say to companies that have like precursors to these things? You know, for instance, they 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 might have, uh, you know, master data management. They might have some kind of software. Uh, uh, D CICD early yeah. version. They might have some kind of um, business intelligence department and uh, siloed, as you might imagine. Yeah. Uh, how would they go from th those precursors to the new way of doing yeah, things? Yeah. So I think I think one shift that's happened over the last few years, and I used to hate this when I was a customer, right? So I've only been here for five years, and I used to hate when any tech company would go, "We have this great solution. You need to throw everything else away mm. and replace it with this." Yeah, sorry, I'm not going to do that, right? I've got all this investment, I've got people trained, The pro it's not going to go well at first, right? So, yeah. yeah, thanks, no. And so the approach here is this: plat these platforms, ours and everyone else's, should be, and in case ours, is fully extensible. Okay. Meaning, if you have your own master data management platform, plug it in here, use these oh. other things across it. If I have a master data management program and platform building customer 360, and I have data across multiple clouds that needs governance, you do it like that. Okay. Right. Um, or if you have your own your own AI build platform, but you need governance around it, you don't need to replace your AI build platform. I see. You should have governance around it. In fact, our biggest customers for our AI governance or ML ops platform mm -hmm. literally uses every tool known to humankind plus some they've built themselves. Yeah. And for the CDO in that organization to get the level of governance that he required, he couldn't go to the thousands of data scientists in the bank and say, sorry, you got to stop using all these tools that you all love, yeah. uh, and you got to use this one tool. That, that's not an answer. His team needs a single pane of glass to operate from, and they need to get certain things. Mm -hmm. And back to data fabric, I said, it needs to be active. It's active metadata. Mm -hmm. You need to actively get metadata from the different parts of your ML AI pipeline meaning from the point of request to the implement to the build 
design, build, implementation, and ongoing operationalization, how do I co collect information in that whole process automatically mm. and put it into this governance framework? So that's kind of how, how you see implementing these, these things at scale. All right, that makes sense. I think, um, I think it's, it's hard to miss that this transformation is happening. And uh, in all likelihood, people do have these legacy systems in place. What's a, one piece of advice you would give to people that, that are looking to sort of modernize and, and start working with this? What's the, where's the starting point? Yeah, so I, again, I think the starting point is with the use case or set of use cases. Okay. What, is, what is the place that you're going to get value? How are you going to implement it? Who's going to be using it? And make mm. them part of the process. Mm. Start with a business strategy. Okay. You can't have a technology strategy that's connected to a business strategy. You need to drive something with technology that makes your company better, cheaper, or faster. All right. Well, Seth, uh, it's been fun, and I think I'm a little bit smarter now after having talked to you about this, so I hope the audience uh, got a lot out of it. And if you're interested in uh, talking more about uh, data fabric, data mesh, and everything data, probably, um, uh, get in touch with Seth. Yep. Thanks. Thanks nice to meet you, thanks Robert. Thanks for being here.